Good afternoon and welcome to our fifth town hall with the CEO 2020. I am happy to have uh, some great people with us today. Uh, my intro is going to be very short so I can get to them and all the questions that we have for our guests. Um, and one of the biggest things about this every week is this is a way that we can stay in touch with our participants, we are, with our stakeholders, with our donors, uh, and the community at large, because we try to bring people who will have something to say to the whole community, but also communicate with the people that we interact with in our programming. Um, I am more than happy uh, to talk about uh, a, a situation that happened today. As I was coming on, our guests for next week were calling me. And so I had these three entertaining people that you'll be meeting in just a moment. I had them on hold, so I just popped in like five minutes before the show, so, uh, or the town hall, I guess it's a show. Um, and so they were a little flustered. I kept them flustered. I was flustered. Uh, they were calm and cool, I should say. I just want somebody to feel flustered with me today. Uh, <laughs> you know, I get before, it. Before we get started, and before I introduce you to these great people and the organizations that they represent, uh, can we pull up the poll question for the day? And while we are filling out the poll question, I'll tell you a little bit about the people uh, that we have uh, coming up. I guess it's up. What is the status of your business? Select one of the following. And yeah, we all want to know that. We need help. We need contributions. I guess today, as we fill out the poll, uh, is Jackie Atchison. Um, and Jackie, I just, you know, have gotten a chance to meet her and entertain her uh, on Tuesday at one of our practices. And she was so uh, entertaining um, before through Susan Breen that some people may know that I had to meet her for myself. And once I met her, I said, wow, we got to get her on. And so we were able to get her on. But uh, Jackie, as I will tell you more about her later on, uh, as this poll is over, and you can tell I'm filling time as you all fill out the poll, and as we move forward, um, and I think it's about done. Well, anyhow, I'll move on to introducing because of time, and I want to get to, we have a lot of questions, and I want to get to them today. Uh, so our guest with us is Jackie Atchison. Jackie is from Arts Council for Monterey County, and she's the executive director there. And as we all know, the importance of art and the arts in our in our life, and particularly in my life, it changed me. It helped me become a person that got a little more well-rounded uh, because I was just a kind of a sports-focused guy. And then once I took a music appreciation class, uh, it expanded who I was as a person. And I would have never would have thought that, you know, getting deeper and learning more about the arts and more about composers uh, would, would expand me as a person. And it did that. So I'm so happy to have you on here, Jackie. And um, I'm looking forward to allowing everyone who doesn't don't know you to get to know you. Uh, the next person I'm going to talk about is Susie Pusa. And, and she is just energy. Um, and every time I'm around her, I feel like I get a little bit smarter, a little bit better, a little bit more, you know, risky, um, uh, a little less um, conservative in some of the th way I approach things. And I'll tell you a story about that real quickly is that Susie uh, went to Detroit where I'm from. And, you know, I was sitting down with her and she said, hey, you're from Detroit, right? And I said, yeah. And she starts talking to me. So she starts telling me about all the beautiful um, artistic places that she visited in Detroit. And some of the places are in kind of a sketchy area. So I was a little bit worried when she started talking about that. But what I really realized was she knew more about Detroit than I did. And I felt <laughs> so bad. And I take pride in wearing that D on my hat, on my cap, on my hat with the big D on it for Detroit. And you know, all my Detroit paraphernalia. And and then I, I look around and hear someone who knows more about Detroit than me. And I spend 19 years there. 
you know, growing up in the city before going off to college. And so when she told me that, and she told me some of the areas uh, that she had visited, um, that's when I knew I had to hang around her and learn more about Susie. And Susie is the CEO for Rancho Seattle and the work that they do over there with the schools and with kids and young people who were much like me, uh, you know, someone who needed some guidance and some direction and also at the same time was um, uh, quite misled uh, by a lot of people growing up and, and needed some mentorship in my life. And, um, and Susie and the school provides it. They give a lot of young people a lot of great opportunities to be successful in life and turn out like a Bill Shelton. And, and, and I, I'm proud of, that, of myself in saying that because some people like Susie grabbed hold <laughs> to me and allowed me to become the person that I have become. Uh, so I'm happy to have Susan here to talk about that. Ron Johnson, well, what can I say? Everywhere I go, people, first of all, some people say, are you Ron Johnson? And I know that we have 1% African-Americans in Monterey County. I know that. But me and Ron don't look anything alike. He's way taller than me by about four inches. He's smarter than me. Most people think he looks better than me. So when they say that to me, I, I fall back a little bit, but overall, I couldn't be compared to a better person. So I take it as a huge compliment. And sometimes I go, yeah, I'm Ron Johnson. Um, <laughs> then they're going to tell me about how great a guy Ron Johnson is when they find out that I'm not Ron Johnson. And they say, well, he's just done so much. And I hear his name. And those who don't even know him talk about him. So, you know, Ron Johnson is the CEO for the Boys and Girls Club of Monterey County. And he just, you know, he's he's already become a role model for me. And the way he's humble, um, he's um, the type of person who reaches out and will reach out to you before you reach out to him. Um, and he's really low key in his approach, but really effective. And uh, Ron also played with the Philadelphia Eagles and most athletes who made that level are usually somewhat arrogant and a little bit cocky and confident. And he's just confident. And, and that's the part that I like about Ron the most. Uh, he's a silent, confident person. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And I'm trying to be more like him. Very kind. So, Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm happy to have all three of these people um, with me. And I'll quit running my mouth. And I'll get to the main reason why we're all here is really to hear what they have to say and how they some of the questions that they will address. So I know that we have a lot. So Jacob, I'll let you throw out the first question and we'll just tackle it and get going. So the first question is for all three of our panelists. What are the two biggest challenges you as a CEO and your organization face in this COVID-19 environment? How have you had to adjust your programs? Should I start? You want to take it? Okay. Well, I think for, for all nonprofits, funding is always a struggle. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, um, we receive a lot of funding from the County of Monterey, and they've had to reduce it for this upcoming year by more than 43%. So that affects not just us, but also the 100 arts organizations that we support with the majority of that funding. So it, it's, it's making us reshift on who we're gonna allow to apply for this funding since it's so much more, uh, such a smaller pot. So, you know, we're still working on that. Um, we heard like at the end of, well, I guess it was about March 13th, Friday the 13th, we heard rumblings about um, shelter in place. I think Alameda or the Bay Area started it. Um, and then we heard the schools. And so the schools all shut down on that Monday. And that put a lot of our teaching artists um, out of work. So we've been fortunate that we have reserves that we um, did receive a PPP so we could you know, keep the, the, some of the artists on staff and give them special projects. You know, but we're also see, trying to figure out how to do this distance learning for, for art classes. So it is uh, core curriculum. It is required by the state of California for us to have these educational classes. Um, and how do we do that to where the kids are still getting the same connection, um, engagement with the teacher? 
you know, via a Zoom call. So we're working on that. We're planning it for the next school semester, um, at least for one semester, if not more. So we're, you know, actively making those changes. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's it's a new world we're coming into, and we're 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 preparing for it. Yeah, Susie, I, I think it hits you probably even harder because of how that affects you. So I, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about the impact on you. Well, Jackie referenced the closing of the schools and you know, what this has done, this remote learning model, it's really highlighted the privilege gap uh, between the haves and the have nots. And in Monterey County, of course, we have a very obvious uh, you know, the high, uh, some of the most highly privileged people in the United States and some of the least privileged people in the United States are all right here in Monterey County. And those who are the least privileged are those that we're serving. And, you know, the young people that we serve, uh, the traditional school system doesn't work for them. They've, it, that's already been demonstrated. And so they need the structure and quite frankly, the um, substitute support structure and affirmation that Rancho Cielo provides for them when they're on campus. Quite frankly, Bill, they're safer on campus than off campus. And so um, it's just it's just been heartbreaking for us. Um, what we have been doing is made sure everybody has a computer, everybody's got internet access. You know, we're having regular Zoom meetings, we're delivering food packages and other kinds of goodies at least uh, several times a week. Uh, touching it, you know, touching base with every student. And then we are going to, now that we're moving into this next stage, we are going to reopen the vocational programs, the vocational tracks for the summer. So we have the Great. Culinary Academy right now doing curbside pickup so that those young people can continue to gain those skills that they missed out on. And next week we start up with the tiny home building for about six weeks, again, because they got shortchanged on their skill building. Right. Yeah, it's the, the, the effect of it is, is so deep, you know, in so many ways. You know, we see a lot of the things that we see on TV and in the news, but but when we are looking at the people that it's affecting who you never see on the news, um, and we see the real stories behind the story, um, makes us all like, you know, make, makes me feel, um, you know, the, the pit in my stomach as you're telling me that, because I know you know, idle minds and idle time, you know, mm -hmm. it just does, you know, nothing good use comes out of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more they can be in an encouraging, supportive environment like your program in your school, uh, then the better off they are. You know, I was, you know, when I was with my grandmother in a supportive, you know, strong environment, I was okay. It was when I was in my home environment, which was unstable. Uh, was when I had the most problems and I was doing the things that I should not been of doing, be doing. So, you know, those were the times that I that I had the, the most difficulty. So, yes, you know, I, I completely understand what you just said. Ron, what you... Yeah, the, a lot of the same things that, that Jackie and Susie are dealing with. We are at Boys and Girls Clubs. We, Bill, you've been in our both of our clubhouses. We've got, um, and our, our program is mainly building-centered. Um, and we're seeing 600 kids a day on a, in normal, normal circumstances. Um, and we've had to really adjust in that mid-March timeframe. Um, our biggest challenge was, was having to close those doors and find another way to keep the connection with our kids. Um, like, uh, like Susie mentioned, a lot of the distance learning, um, virtual programming, um, our, our staff rolled up their sleeves and they were able to create some fantastic programming and, and borrow best practices from other clubs and just come up with, with new ways to connect. Um, the, the issue of, of access to technology comes up. So that's something that was a kind of an ongoing battle with us that we're dealing with. If, if they've got the Chromebook, they don't have internet access. So, you know, we're just, we're just fighting through those, those hurdles and, and trying to get it done. We're, we're serving kids that are um, six to 18. And, and you mentioned kids you know, left of their own devices um, while their parents are, are working in, an, in a household without adults. 
and that is a bad recipe. Um, so we're not only doing the, the virtual programming, our, our staff's also uh, making calls uh, or texting our, our kids to keep that connection. Um, and then the main thing really is just keep our, keep our staff focused and committed to the mission. Um, to making sure that our kids are still getting their academic support and making sure their their character is on point where it needs to be, um, and then also that just that we're we're making sure that we're meeting their their health and nutritional needs. So yeah, we, we're we, we're, we're our clubhouses are closed, but a lot of things going on, a lot of good things. Yeah, we we are doing a lot of the same things that that you all um, spoke of. Uh, with the virtual teachings, and even that is difficult, you know, uh, because it, it seemed even more difficult when they were in school, because now they were on the computer, you know, a lot longer than they would enjoy, you know, if they're not playing video games, you know, but when you're learning and you're being developed through the programs that we have, along with what the school is doing, then that makes it even more challenging to keep the attention of the young folks that we need because they said I've already been on the computer for you know four hours a day or five hours a day learning you know and now I got to go into a virtual class and learn some more about you know my interpersonal skills and self-development and all that so you know our staffs had to find ways to keep it exciting energizing they become teachers outside of the teachers so mm -hmm. you know uh, using technology but I, I think it's here to stay. Um, and I think that we will begin to learn how to manipulate it better and make it even more um, enjoyable for the students to be participatory in, uh, be, particularly when it's a rainy day. You know, rain days, you know, that usually throws everything off. And now we learn on rain days, we can do it virtually. So, um, you know, it's been no helpful. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's nothing like the the interpersonal communication of, of the socialization of being around somebody. You can't replace that, you know. Uh, we're not robots, so you, and so we need that. So uh, I'm sorry, Jacob, I'll take another question. Getting excited. Our next question, how have you been collaborating with other organizations to deliver services during the shelter in place? And how do you anticipate collaboration will change as a result of the pandemic? Well, we we worked with the Community Foundation to um, increase some funding to provide um, relief funds to the artists. We were fortunate enough that we got a, a quick grant. They were amazing at the uh, Monterey Peninsula Foundation to help us, or excuse me, Community Foundation for Monterey County. And we um, shared that with many of the artists in the communities. Um, we're also working with some of the businesses here in Seaside to um, provide some opportunities for artists to keep them working and you know and producing income. And we've been doing that uh, since the shelter in place happened. Um, and you know we're, we're really just right now trying to support the artists and the arts organizations as much as we can to just make sure that uh, they can recover from this. You know, 97% of arts organizations in the county shut their doors and canceled their programs and their events. You know, first ones to close, last ones to reopen. It's been pretty devastating to uh, the creative sector in the county. Ron? Yeah, with, uh, with us, we've, food insecurity is, is a big issue in Monterey County. And so we've collaborated with the Food Bank and the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, um, to name a couple, and uh, just pulled our resources. And now we're uh, and we worked with with them to create these food distribution centers. And um, we started out small, um, 500 or so, and now we're shoot we're over a couple of thousand a week uh, meals that we're able to distribute um, to the communities of uh, not only the Monterey Peninsula, but also um, South County, Soledad and Gonzalez and Salinas. So um, those collaborations, um, just so, so much more efficient. And um, the, the funders have been great. The Community Foundation 
provided one grant for us and United Way Monterey County also has. Um, so we've, we've just been trying to be as efficient as we can with our uh, collaborating with, uh, with other agencies, private and nonprofit. So we also got some of those same grants that Ron is referencing. And because the food bank has been so oversubscribed, we've had to utilize those grants in order to provide food for our young people. Um, I've got a lot of things I could highlight, but one, one collaboration I want to highlight that is going to be different uh, for a while, I think, is our relationship with Monterey County Behavioral Health Department. They're, they're a critical part of of what we do um, because they do groups groups and also individual counseling for our young people across programs and of course they're having to do that via telehealth now which is new for them and new for the students and in some cases that's working um, and in some cases it's working better and uh, maybe because a young person might be more willing to talk over the phone than in person and reveal some things that are going on so it's not all bad actually yeah, I, you know, I constantly hear the stories out there. You know, you see the long lines at the food banks, you know, thousands of people, you know, lined up, you know, in all types of vehicles, which, you know, from high end vehicles to, to vehicles that, you know, you wonder if they're going to make it, you know, through the line. But, uh, you know, the one thing is, you know, how do we relieve that, that, that load that's on the food banks? And you all have spoken some examples of how to do that. We got involved in delivering some food uh, through Alicell School District and uh, get some food out to people. You know, we had our coaches uh, from the first T program go out and do that. And it was, you know, you, the, the, you would have thought we were delivering steak, you know, literally steak. And, you know, we were just basically giving non-perishable items to people and they were acting like it was steak. Uh, it's tough. It's rough. Um, you know, the collaborative efforts and why I like the three people I have on today is because, you know, I constantly look at ways that I want to be more involved with you. We all work together now, but even to a larger degree, you know, and I believe that Monterey's County, you know, even though we're one of the wealthiest places in, in, in the country, if not the United States, uh, I think we're all going to, have to find a way that we can allow that community to give a huge lump sum so that we have our own reserve, like a community reserve. And it's kind of what, what Dan and Steve John did by uniting and having some emergency funds. But I think towards the end of the year, you know, the last quarter, you know, we may have to do a huge fundraiser just for all our nonprofits who have hung on, you know, uh, not just the, 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 the ones that have the most popularity either. Uh, there are some smaller ones that are really struggling and they may not make it. You know, every time I look around, I, I, I hear of one closing uh, in the Monterey County area as well as in the United States from friends. So, you know, it, it's rough out here. It's tough on families. Uh, we have young people working now anywhere they can to help support the family. Uh, we interviewed some of our young people for the John Zoller Scholarship. And one of the things she talked about was having to work, you know, these extra jobs because the parents don't have jobs right now. So now they're doing jobs, whatever they can find to do to help support their family. So uh, it is it's, it's hard times out here. And, you know, collaboration, I think, will get even stronger uh, as we move forward. Jacob, another question? I would just like to remind the audience, if you have any questions, you can answer the, or ask them in the Q&A section. For our third question, I'm going to show the results of the poll. When you had to make the hard decision to close your doors, how did you come up with a plan with the nature of the information changing on a daily basis? What are your top priorities when making these big decisions? And how do you decide when to return? You can see based on the poll, most attendees have not returned to work. So the, the top priorities, of course, are safety first, mission second, financials third, I think in that order. Um, we've written extensive protocols, cross-referenced for the construction program, cross-referenced the construction protocols, and for the culinary program, cross-referenced the hospitality protocols. And um, 
today I was out inspecting the buses because they've installed plexiglass and shower curtains <laughs> so that they can oh, wow. still transport young people. Good. So yeah, safety first. Absolutely. Yeah, but I mean, that was obviously the safety. I, mean, I think I was saying on, on Friday the 13th, hearing all these rumblings going on, um, we all left work and, and I was just kept thinking about it. And I sent a text to the staff says, we're not going back in. Um, you know, if you want to go get your computers, whatever you need um, to be comfortable working from home, please go take care of that. And we've been doing that since, you know, that middle of March. Um, we've proven that we can continue our work, um, working remotely. We, you know, check in with each other all the time. Um, it's been a challenge because, you know, we. I just became the executive director less than three months ago. So, you know, we, we have a lot of goals and, and challenges that we're, we're working on. So um, it'd be nice if we could be working together, but still, you know, safety is our biggest concern. Um, we just, we take turns coming in and out of the office. We check with each other to say who's going to be there. Um, it seems to be working. You know, we have set up protocols. We, we purchased the, the hand sanitizer dispenser for our office and also for our artworks program. That's in Pacific Grove at the American Tin Cannery. And, you know, we have people sign in and out just for if we need contact tracing. Um, you know, we just set those protocols up. We haven't opened up the art workshop to the public, even though legally we can as of June 12th. Um, we're leaving that up to the artists to see how comfortable they are with, you know, having the public visit them. So we're taking it day by day, pretty much. Yeah, you're, you're get, a, get the same answer from me. Um, definitely say, uh, safety first, and, um, and that's for the general public. Um, and then we also uh, needed to consider our, our mission and were we, are we still able to accomplish our mission? And you just have to find another way. Um, right. You know, it's like you just have to find another way to make those connections and and uh, and work towards um, serving our kids, the kids of this community, they're counting on us. Yeah, innovation, you know, um, and and I watch the school systems do it too. The teachers are doing it. The, you know, they're doing it just like we've like we're having to do it, having to do it. Mm -hmm. They're having to do it too. Um, and I watched how they've been innovative and in, in what they've done. And so I've tried to, you know, steal a little bit from them and share with our staff, hey, are we doing it this way? And, you know, our staff members have come up with innovative ways to do it. So um, it's, it's, it's the most challenging week to week thing I've ever had in my life. You yeah. know, you know, you, you think playing three sports in high school is tough and one time two sports doing the same, you know, baseball and track at the same time. I thought that was hard. You know, this is hard. The uncertainty of each week uh, that you're facing is hard. You know, uh, rules change, you know, statewide rules change sometimes overnight, you know, uh, you know, the jitteriness of, of, of our leadership sometimes saying, hey, well, we don't know if we're gonna do this. And wait a minute, we got this plan. If we spend all this money on this and you all say we can't do it, you know, then that's money, you know, that we desperately need, that we wanna have a service that's, you know, gone, you know, um, at least for that particular event or that particular uh, activity. So you have to be very careful about everything we do week to week. So yeah, the safety, I think, jumps out at us, but it's all the other decisions that you're making with staff. You know, oh, you know, we can't overstaff this week, you can't understaff that week, and you know, and, and you need so many people, and because we're doing so many new and innovative things, you know, you got staff now working as hard as they've ever worked in their lives because they're also they they they're they're used to doing the programming that we normally do. Yeah, it's tough work. It's long hours, but and it's and it's and it's um, uh, sometimes puts you in a mode of fatigue. But this is now you're learning as you go. Uh, particularly, I believe the older you get, the more you're learning as you go on how to use technology. And so staff are working. You know, you ask them, and they'll tell you uh, at a lot of different organizations. We're working this 
hard as we've ever worked in our lives because we had to do so much learning that we don't really have a lot of downtime, even when we're supposed to be off the clock sometimes. So, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest struggle. Uh, you know, the, the keeping the mission going and serving the people and trying to be there for people when they need us most. That's the toughest part. Uh, and, and I think safety wise, I think the cost of the safety, the unexpected cost of the safety, I think is also having people had to, you know, uh, shudder in their boots kind of a little bit, because, uh, shiver in their boots, I should say, uh, <laughs> because the PPE cost is way more than any of us, yeah. than I could have thought it would have been, you know. Definitely. Jacob. Our next question, how can private, public, and nonprofit organizations work together to improve the economic conditions of families and communities seriously impacted by the pandemic? I guess in the same way we do mm -hmm. when there's not a pandemic. I mean, we collaborate, all of us collaborate, all of us. I can't wait to do that again. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I think we just do, you know, this time around is, is kind of is, the expectations probably would be higher uh, because even in a wealthy community like ours, there's still so, you know, funding still goes to a certain limit and it starts to get tight. And when you have people um, look at, they become more aware of how the dollars are being used or distributed. And so therefore, you know, they look at ways to make that dollar go further. And so collaboration has always been a big deal the last, you know, 10, 15 years for donors, but now it's really becoming a big deal because they're having to make tough decisions on where they put these dollars at, that they used to have more discretionary income that either because of the stock market or whatever, they don't have as much discretionary income as they once had. So, you know, even they are making tougher decisions. So I, I think that's one of the things that, that will, you know, will be a, be a big, play a big part. I've got a, got a quick story about that um, object lesson is there's a program called uh, Farmers to Families, and um, it's a USDA sponsored program that um, with all the, the turmoil and the, and the, the downturn and the in the restaurant ordering of produce and, and foods, um, they had to, uh, the orders were really down dramatically on um, uh, in the ag industry. So um, these ag companies were needing to, to churn the, the produce and back into the ground. Well, there was a, um, a program concept that was brought, well, instead of wasting that food, is there a way that we can still package it and ship it and get it to families in need, to, to hungry families? So they created this, um, they received a grant um, and they were able to uh, continue to produce these, uh, these food boxes. They were like 15 pound food boxes and uh, distribute them to nonprofits who could then distribute them to their constituents. So um, we had a board member who was uh, affiliated with one of the ag companies that provided that service. And um, for the past, it's been about six weeks now, they've been uh, shipping, uh, it's eight or 900 boxes, food boxes to our clubs and we're distributing them to our families and also a few churches and a few um, low house and a few low housing developments low-income housing developments. And um, it's to the point now that Boys and Girls Clubs of America um, is involved and those the distribution is gonna go to clubs in the Bay Area and, and up in the Sacramento area, so. Oh, that's great. That's, that's great. great. Yeah, great I, I heard, I saw that, um, I either I read it and I, and I was reading about that and saw uh, that they were doing it, because I, I saw, the story on 2020 or 60 minutes, whatever it was, they showed the farmers, you know, churning up good produce. And I was like, oh my Lord, all that good food, you know, and people are hungry and I'm watching lines in Texas 
that are backed up a thousand cars um, and then we're churning up food. So I'm so happy that, that you know, uh, I can hear even from a from a person that's more, you know, associated with it, uh, that that's happening. Because uh, I think I read about that that was on a, a proposal and they were trying to work out some details and, and the details have been the Boys and Girls Club doing it. You know. We're just one. We're just one nonprofit of many, but um, it's definitely a it's a service that's so appreciated by our families. And um, here's a I don't know if you can see this sign, but the the families pull up in a car, and then we load the the boxes into their into their cars, and they and one one uh, family gave us this. <laughs> in front of our, our staff and then there's the other side of it yeah yeah i mean so kind of some beautiful you know tough times but some beautiful things are still coming out of uh, out of these times hey jacob you want to slide another one in there so we can uh, as we i know time i looked up at the clock and i saw the little thing beeping so i want to get a few more in our next question, what have you learned in the last year that will help your company in the next year? Could you repeat the question? Because I was muted and they unmuted me and I couldn't hear it. <laughs> yes. What have you learned in the last year that will help your company in the next? Can I take that one first? <laughs> sure. How to use technology better to communicate better, um, to uh, engage people more. Um, that's that's what I would take uh, uh, out of it that I would take into the next year. Jackie? Um, well, we've been talking about this for a while and that's diversifying our revenue. And we rely heavily on grants, um, and particularly government grants, probably 45% of our revenue. Um, so we want to look at doing more earned revenue, uh, more programming. And we're, we're getting very creative because of this and coming up with some great ideas. So I think in the next um, month or two, you'll see some um, pretty awesome new programs that our staff will be introducing to help support the arts in this county. I'd say something that you said earlier, Bill, which is that Zoom doesn't replace face-to-face -face human interaction. And so we're trying to figure out how do we get that back still safely. Right. And I would say uh, just diversified re revenue streams and, and be open to, um, to, to being innovative and figuring out um, other ways of doing things. Don't get into the routine of uh, you know, X event in March, X event in, in, in June, X event in September. Um, think creatively about other things that you could be doing um, and just just in a different way. Yeah, I think it's forced all of us to do that that part. Um, diversify our funding streams, um, look at ways that we can not be so reliant on the same events and programs that we do as fundraisers all the time because they become a part of your natural um, you know, a pattern of, of, of business, your MO, you know, we do this, we do this, we do this. And, um, and, and I'm, you know, one of our events this year, the BBNB is going to be done virtually. It's going to be done uh, using uh, our different donors and some of our contributors and some of our sponsors homes. They're going to be hosting um, uh, review parties and we're going to be dropping in in each home and, and having some fun with it. So, you know, we've had to learn to, to adjust and, and maybe we'll do something, you know, similar to that next year uh, when things are, you know, a little bit looser and we have a vaccine and we have a treatments and stuff like that for this, um, that we still might do some of those things uh, and have some, uh, uh, you know, a different spin on things, not to be redundant all the time in, in the way we do things. So, yeah, I think we've had to review that and look at those, uh, those areas too. Susie? I think I answered. I just like hearing you talk. So oh, that's so anytime, sweet of you. Anytime I can, anytime I can throw something at you, I will. So, 
I don't think I have anything to add. Yeah, usually a lot of wisdom over there. That's why I try to pick it up whenever I can. You're but sweet. Um, uh, we um, we definitely, you know, um, have to continue to look at, you know, how we uh, become so structured in how we operate and run. Uh, and I think that's been shaken up a little bit. So hopefully it's been shaken up for the good, you know. Um, you know, I, I particularly, uh, and with Susie's case over with the school, you know, I just, you know, being one of those kids from one of those neighborhoods, um, you know, I just know how meaningful that is, you know. Um, I love what we do uh, at all the other programs, Boys and Girls Club, you know, Future Citizens Foundation, First Tee, Pay It Forward, all our programs. But it's, it's also something special about, you know, having a place where you feel safe and yeah. being educated, you know, too. And and that's something that we all have in common. Uh, Jacob, I'm sorry. I think my cousin has a question in there. So he just texted me over my phone. So I was looking at it. So he said, I got a question I sent. So I'll listen. The next question that we have, how can the public support nonprofits right now, especially if they do not feel they can contribute financially? Mm. That was probably him. I got one. Uh, I got an answer to that. Go ahead, Susie. Don't tell us what we should be doing. You know <laughs> what you should be doing, Ron? You should <laughs> complete the sentence. I love, I love hearing that. Like, yeah, exactly. How many times a week, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I appreciate all the ideas. I just don't appreciate. I won't shoot on you if you don't shoot on me. Yeah, I, I, I feel I feel the same. You know, the, the ideas are great. I I actually um, like you. Bill wrote a um, letter to the community with the uh, with the issue of George George Floyd and and um, and got several um, letters back or comments back. And um, I I appreciate those comments. I appreciate the feedback. So. Um, in terms of um, those, those uh, the feedback that's going to help us get better. It's going to help us uh, sharpen our pencils and and maybe do things in a better way. Completely open to to those types of ideas and and those are that's that's been very helpful for me. Jackie, well, I would like to stress uh, advocacy at this point. Um, you know, we're California, the state is going through budget hearings right now, and there's a lot of questions about cutting the education budget. So it's the first thing cut. Um, so we have on our website uh, a template for um, parents and anyone who's interested in our education program to write letters to the state, to their school board districts, you know, and say, please don't cut the education budget. It's it's vital to us. And, and also for people to really understand that arts are essential. You know, I, I want people to remember when this first happened, when we first went into shelter in place and what were people in New York City and Italy doing? They were coming out to their balconies, they were singing, they were playing music, they were engaging. It's, it's healing, it's connection with you know, other human beings that are going through the same um, stress. And we all need that uh, stress reliever, and and arts is a great, great method for that. Yeah, sometimes um, I think I think people forget when they see Toby Keith out there at the AT and T. I think they forget sometimes he's an artist. <laughs> you know, right. you know, uh, they forget that all the the artists who are providing entertainment for those who are locked or shut in right now, you know, that they can hear free concerts. They can hear music, they can hear things that help them take their mind off the things that stress them out during this period of time for a moment or for a few hours. Um, the people who are going on air and um, providing artwork, I mean, there's an artist who's now, he's drawing, kind of capturing some of these things uh, live on one of the channels I was flipping through and I saw it. And I was like, man, that is so cool. And he, they, they're doing it for free, you know. Right. Uh, it doesn't cost you any money. You know, you can tune in on your phone or wherever you are, and you can um, or your computer, and you can you can watch it for free. 
you know, and so the the artists are giving back in a way that they know how to, and that's through their talents, you know, so uh, it, it's very important. Um, Susie, I hear you. Go ahead, I'll shut up. No, no, I said what I wanted to say. Ron, I, I, I just, the reason why I pick on Susie all the time, because like I said, I, I can love- take it. You love her. I love getting her <laughs> like out there because you know she is very energetic, outspoken, and I always know she has an opinion on something we're talking about. So uh, that's why I always go back to Susie so quick. But um, yeah, I mean, so you know, our, our programs are important. It's amazing that we always go to education to cut. You know, that's the only thing about some of the great programs that help support companies and businesses. But I said, oh, I just hope they don't come back and now say, oh, we, we put all that money out. Let's go cut education, you mm -hmm. know, and that's the, the first place we seem to go to. Um, the, the, the school system supports our programs in different ways. Uh, at least I know in my case they do in a big way uh, because without the transportation, they help provide, you know, we don't serve 10,000 kids a year without, their, without the partnership with them. Uh, so I, I get worried when I hear people talking about cutting education because, you know, every day we save a life with our programs. We change a life, we save a life with the programs that our organizations provide. So, you know, education should be where we should be looking at first. I think there's some other areas we could look at um, and, and do a better job uh, with cuts. So, uh, Jacob, we got time for one more question and then I'll wrap it up. Yes, we have one last question and comment here. It's thank you all for serving the community in Monterey County. And the question is, as connected as you are with the youth of Monterey County, how can surrounding local nonprofits support the youth or support your efforts? Well, I know um, for boys and girls clubs, we're we're uh, the other nonprofits that serve youth have been fantastic, and, and um, I know that um, that Bill's Bill's group and Susie um, have been great with our our events. We do an event called the Gang Prevention Summit, and um, and Bill's been great about sending kids from First Tee and Future Citizens to um, to participate and be a part of that. Um, we uh, we have a career expo that well we're we're kind of retooling that but these are community wide events we want kids from all over the county um, to participate in our football camp and our uh, guild basketball academy camps um, that um, we really want to get the message of good character and healthy lifestyles and academic success. Uh, out to the entire county um, youth. So that's one way that um, that we could support is to send your kids to events like that. Jackie? Well, we have a lot of amazing youth arts organizations in this county. And, you know, of course, they've had to cancel their programs and stuff. But once we're able to, um, if you could support them, financially uh, volunteer for them, um, promote them. You know, there, there's many, many of them and um, you can check our website and learn more about them. I think they're really gonna need it when it's time to reopen. They're gonna need the support. Mm -hmm. Susie? I'd likewise just say refer young people that, that would be appropriate, you know, age 16 to 24 to our program so we can serve them. Let us, yeah. let us do our thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that I think that this next, you know, six months is gonna be pivotal, pivotal to people's budget. Um, and if we're not um, fully uh, supported by the community, then 2021 will look really tough uh that first quarter you know because that's usually the heaviest quarter of lifting that we have to do is in that first quarter uh to get people back wound up because you've had the holidays you've had some other things go through 
and and getting people back refocused on what we do as charities and nonprofits. Um, so you know we have to um, have a big push from our community to support us financially. These next six months are going to be big. You know I tell people June through December, um, and really I always tell people it's really June through November. Uh, because once December hits, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, hit or miss because of people focus changes so abruptly to family, you know, you start seeing it, you know, because of the giving and the, and people coming into town and, and your family, your kids and grandkids start to come in. So, you know, the focus just changes. So I tell people the next June through November is going to be big, you know, for the nonprofits and it's going to be big to see who makes it, you know, going into 2021. You know, we've had some sad stories of, of nonprofits closing. Um, and I'm not going to start naming a few, but, you know, we've had a few already go by the wayside and they did good work. You know, we've lost some chapters and some offices, you know, mm -hmm. in our county who have had to close their doors. So, you know, I would say that, you know, all of our donors, you know, look at stretch gifts, you know, look at, you know, giving a little bit more than you normally would to all these organizations and particularly the ones I have before me on this show, because I know what they do with the money for sure. So, um, you know, I, I just encourage, you know, and I, uh, to all my donors, you know, just, you know, to have some stretch gifts for the organizations that you support. And a lot of my donors support three charities and nonprofits that, you know, excuse me, nonprofits that we have here. So, you know, uh, you know, I just ask them to, to give some stretch gifts, give a little bit more this year. We're gonna try to do that as a individual family, my family, uh, we're gonna try to do it and support some people. Um, and I just challenge, you know, the community to try to do it. You know, every dollar counts, you know, somebody said, what can I do? I said, you know, uh, he said, I don't have but $5. I said, $5 is a lot, mm -hmm. you know, $10 is a lot. You know, you start putting those tens together, you start getting hundreds. <laughs> And you start putting the hundreds together, you start getting thousands. So it's all it all counts, you know. And I tell people the ten dollar gift is just as important to me as a fifty thousand dollar gift. I treat them the both the same way, you know. I I love on the same the donors the same way because it's a sacrifice either way you look at it. Because they could give it to somebody else or to another cause, or they could be selfish and use it on themselves. So um, every gift is important. I think the next six months. That's the message I'm trying to say with this long dissertation that I just gave about it. But uh, so support all of our charities um, and, um, you know, keep doing what you do and stretch yourself to do a little bit more. Yeah. Um, in wrapping, I just want to thank Jackie and I want to thank Susie and Ron, you know, for giving up their time. Uh, we, I, they were actually working during the practice. We saw people actually working as we were practicing. Uh, and uh, and because it, it takes a lot to keep the things that we all do going. And uh, these three people, I think you won't find a more committed group of folks. Uh, Susan, Susan Bream is just your biggest fan, Jackie. And she constantly, you know, telling me of all the great things that you're doing. So I hear a lot more from her about what you're doing uh, than I do from you or that I've seen with my own eyes. But hearing from her is just like having my own eyes look at what you're doing. So, um, you know, I think everybody's seen everybody's websites. I would say go to them, support us, you know, help us to keep doing the great work we're doing. We're, we're serving together, you know, um, you know, 20, 30,000 kids a year. Uh, help us to keep doing that. So, um, and we appreciate it. And once again, I just thank you all for coming, being uh, panelists today. Uh, next week, I, I think I got a guy with five Super Bowl rings coming on to talk about, you know, achieving success over adversity. And uh, so, uh, and he's a young person, a young person, I'm calling him young because he was younger than me. Uh, Pepper Johnson that played with the New York Giants and coached with the New England Patriots. And, uh, and the work that you all do is kind of what he's coming on to talk about. You know, uh, people who played a role in him being able to achieve some of the things he has. And hopefully we'll have a couple other special people coming on to talk about some of those same things. So once again, I thank you all for your time. I thank everybody for, for coming and listening to us talk about the great services that we all provide and that they provide, my, my panelists provide to the community. 
and we'll be doing it again next Thursday at 3 p.m. And I hope to see uh, people come in and ask a lot of questions and uh, find out ways that we can use these athletes to come support in our community of Monterey County and get them down there to support us. Uh, and they're doing a lot of things. Ron, before I go, Jerome Bettis has a big computer distribution thing going on. Mm. And, you know, he says, it's just not open to the, you know, the, the young people in Pittsburgh. I want to help kids all over. So, you know, uh, some of these things that people are doing, you know, we need to connect with us on when I hear you talking about some of the issues you're having. So. And that's, uh, that's how it happens too. We just have a conversation and then an opportunity comes up and, I'd love to follow up with you about, about Jerome's yeah. program. Yeah, so, you know, I think you all, you know, could tap into that and, and make use of that. So, uh, again, thank you for coming, and uh, thank you for being panelists, and I'm going to wrap it at that. And I'll just see everybody next week thank doing you. this one more time. Thank, thank you. you. Bill.